talking about that and let me start again. Uh, today I'd like to tell you a couple of things about ELM, the programming language, and my approach to learning basics of functional programming. And I'd like to start this presentation with, uh, with a small uh, backstory. Uh, and this story is about how I started uh, diving into this functional programming uh, world. And uh, this started roughly like two and a half years ago uh, when I was on one of the uh, local TypeScript meeting in my city of Wrocław. And uh, during this, uh, this meeting, uh, the theme for that particular one was functional programming. And there were two talks. One of those was about Marble.js, the library, the TypeScript library for creating backends with uh, functional reactive uh, programming paradigm, and which is a completely different paradigm than just functional programming, but I won't dive into it today. And the second talk was about how static typing of TypeScript helps us with uh, solving common functional programming uh, concepts like function composition. And I remember from that meeting that uh, after all of those talks, I, I understood pretty much nothing, maybe a 10% of what was said. And it was because uh, I didn't know that something like functional programming even existed before this meeting. So all those buzzwords and concepts were just confusing to me. And also at that time, I had like maybe six months of experience in TypeScript. So also some uh, advanced uh, topics about this language was also confusing. But I remember something else. I remember the, fear, the, the excitement from the challenge that was before me. And I remember rushing back to home as soon as possible and just uh, a need to sit in front of my laptop and dive into any tutorials, articles, videos, and so on about functional programming. And yeah, this journey in, in, in FP uh, continues to this day. And uh, with this talk, I'd like to um, show you uh, my approach to beginnings with uh, functional programming and why I, why I think that Elm is a delightful language for learning functional basics of functional programming. Uh, for some of, you, some of you who don't know me, I'm Kajetan Świątek. Of course, you know which company I'm from. Uh, you can find my work at uh, Twitter at Kayetan SW handle or on my blog Kayetan.dev. And today's agenda will be, uh, will be uh, uh, the first thing would be me explaining you why should you be even interested in functional programming? What exactly is Elm and why should you at least try it? Uh, then I thought that uh, we are the web UI community and we are uh, using JavaScript and maybe some of you are, is also using TypeScript, which is the more uh, the most mainstream and the most popular uh, uh, solution for static typing in JavaScript. So I and also Elm provides some solution for static typing. So I decided to uh, compare it to something you may already know. And to sum it up, I show you the alternatives for Elm, so other FP languages that compile to JavaScript. Why should you be even interested in functional programming? Whenever you ask uh, any functional programmer, what is, which is, uh, what is the, um, the main building block of any FP language, that will be pure functions. Pure functions are called, called like that because um, of two reasons. First of, those, uh, first of those is that for every input, they always return the same output. And the second one is they, don't, they do not perform any side effects. And side effects is, I I'd like to define it as uh, any operation that needs uh, access to some external resources, external to the scope of the function. So that may be something like fetching data via, via HTTP or uh, any uh, user interactions with a console or fetching data from database, or even something so simple like uh, 
like grabbing a variable that is outside of a function scope, which is, uh, as you may know, possible in, for example, JavaScript. So you may be wondering how on earth are we going to create our programs if all our functions are pure, because our, our programs are all about side effects, about grabbing data via HTTP from database, etc. And there is even a, a, a joke in a functional programming community that says that uh, if all our programs would be only pure functions, uh, the only th the, the best thing we could do is to heat up our computers because all, all, all those calculations inside our programs would just uh, make the funds in our computers go. And uh, there are a couple of solutions to this problem. Uh, for example, uh, programming languages like Haskell have, have their own abstractions called monads. And of course, I will not dive into it because it's a really complex and confusing topics, topic. And also Elm has its own solution for that, and I'll present it in a couple of minutes. Uh, the second thing is immutability. So if the, you mutate the data structure whenever, uh, uh, so for, uh, let's say we have uh, some data structure, for example, object or array, and we want to update a field of the object on, or on element in an array, if you would like to do it by mutating the, the, this data structure, you would get the reference for that object and just uh, mutate or change the, the, the piece of it you are interested in and the reference for that uh, data structure would not change. In mutability, in, in, in immutability, you would, uh, you would uh, create, uh, first you will create a copy of the entire data structure with the updated piece of it. So the reference changes. And this is quite a difficult topic if, if the immutability is good thing or bad thing, uh, because you could even imagine the performance problem of uh, immutable data structures whenever you have some uh, quite large data structures and you'd like to uh, immutably change it, you have to create a, a whole copy of it and update uh, with the updated piece of it. So I'll just want to inform you that most of the functional languages like Haskell or Elm use this uh, immutability. Uh, easier testing. Easier testing is an out just an outcome from, the, from using pure functions and immutability. And I think that's that because uh, with uh, pure functions, you have functions that for the same input uh, always uh, get uh, always uh, return the same output and you have immutability with uh, uh, data structures which combined make our uh, make our functions and our uh, programs uh, our sequences of operations uh, uh, more uh, predictable more deterministic which is also easier to mock and test uh, the next thing is constant growth and uh, constant growth in terms of, for example, uh, community. There are more, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are more and more functional programmers are, around the world. And the more people involved in functional programming, the more uh, the tooling, the languages, the ID support, uh, it, those are uh, uh, more and more, more better. And, um, also constant growth in terms of the uh, learning resources. Yeah, you can imagine that some, some time ago, uh, if you would ask someone how to learn functional programming, they would guide you to some category theory book, which has uh, 2000 pages and he will, he will tell you to study that, but not today. Today, uh, functional programming languages are as easy to pick up as any other, you just go to the, uh, to the uh, to the main uh, website of the of the um, of the language you get the documentation and you start learning and there are there are a lot of awesome tutorials outside of that, that to to help you with uh, starting and also uh, constant growth in terms of career because uh, the more and more companies are investing in functional programming. There are a lot of, a lot of production applications running in Haskell, for example. And uh, uh, yeah, okay, so. And the last one is that the functional programming broadens your mind. 
And uh, from my perspective, someone who was deeply rooted in uh, object-oriented programming, starting learning functional programming was really uh, refreshing, was really challenging for, for my mind. When, if I started, uh, when I started learning it, I just felt you know, like a five-year-old five five learning something new from, from scratch, like I was learning uh, programming for, for, from grounds up. So that's the fun of it. So what exactly is Elm? Like the web, main website of the, the programming language says, the, the Elm is a delightful language for reliable web applications. So the Elm is a language that compiles to JavaScript and is meant for creating web applications. So you cannot create a, like backend systems or native mobile applications with it, only web applications. So it may as well be competition for uh, the well-known web frameworks like React, like Angular, Swell, Vue, etc. Why should you at least uh, try Elm? Uh, uh, because it provides all the advantages of the FP world that I've already mentioned. So pure functions, immutability, uh, uh, easy, of test easy of testing, uh, constant growth of both tooling, ID supports, the language itself is still developed, and uh, also learning it broadens your mind. Okay, he here let's imagine two worlds, the worlds of easier and harder uh, programming languages, easier and harder in terms of how much time and effort would you, uh, would you, would you have to invest to learn it from scratch and do something productive with the language. Of course, uh, it's all in a comparison between a group of the small group of languages and also the, top, the, the comparison is subjective because the uh, programmer with uh, six months of experience would take a much more time to, to learn a new language, a new technology than someone who has 10 years of experience. But let's just focus on the like a, uh, general opinion of the general population of programmers. So let's make another hard assumption that the easy language here is a uh, JavaScript. Of course, some of you may tell me that uh, JavaScript is not that easy. And it's not because if you dive into more complicated topics like how this behaves, uh, what is prototype, uh, what is proxy, etc., it's not that easy to comprehend. But, but JavaScript is much more approachable for the beginners than, for example, Haskell. And uh, this simply, let's just compare uh, Hello World examples, because JavaScript, uh, JavaScript's Hello World has only one line and uh, uh, it's just an invocation of the uh, log function uh, that logs to the console. But with Haskell, we uh, dive headfirst into monads because monads are a need for creating effect like writing to a console. And where I think Elm fits into this both worlds, I think somewhere in the middle because Elm grabs uh, familiar syntax and familiar concepts from JavaScript and it grabs uh, useful uh, abstractions and data types from Haskell. And it's worth to mention that Elm is really easy to pick up for people who are experiencing JavaScript strictly because of those familiar concepts and syntaxes. What is also distinctive about Elm is its architecture, which is, which is then called the Elm architecture. And uh, the basic, the most, the most basic uh, entity of this architecture is a model. And here, throughout this whole explanation of the architecture, I'll compare it to the uh, most popular uh, solutions for state management, uh, like Redux or NGRX. So in this case, model is something like a state. It represents the data flow, uh, data that flows in our applications. And the model is used for rendering our view, and view is uh, something in Elm that is represented by the built-in function of the same name. 
And view is a function that takes the current model and uh, returns a template that is supposed to be rendered on our uh, in our applications. And on the level of our template in our view, uh, we can send some messages. Uh, messages for, uh, are like actions in uh, Redux or NGRX, and they can be bind, bound to some events, like, for example, buttons on click event. And the messages are then uh, like grabbed from the Elm by the Elm compiler and processed with the update uh, update function. And the update function takes as an input a uh, previous model and the message that was uh, grabbed and it returns the new model. And the, and the cycle goes on and on. And you, you may think that's really a familiar concept because it's all uh, this concept is uh, really similar to the one from those uh, popular state management solutions. And what's an in interesting fact is that uh, Mm. Redux is, as you may know, Redux is based on a Flux, uh, Flux architecture of, of Flux pattern, but Flux pattern is uh, based on the on the Elm architecture. So you could say that uh, Elm in some Elm, Elm architecture is in some way a grandfather of the Redux. And what's also interesting about uh, the Elm architecture is the Elm runtime. And this is something that uh, this is something that's uh, like a black box, and this is uh, Elm's uh, solution for dealing with side effects. On the level of the update function, we can uh, not only uh, like return the the new model, but we also can return a command that should be invoked. Command is something similar, pretty similar to the message, but it's strictly related to the Elm runtime. And uh, for example, we can uh, send a command for uh, for doing a side effect, like calling a uh, grabbing data via uh, HTTP GET. And the Elm runtime, without us knowing it, what's inside, processes this command, and in return uh, returns the 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 usual message that is later up, uh, processed in the update function. So here I'd like to just show you uh, the smallest example of Elm application there is. The application of counter. So we have a text with, uh, with the value of our counter. We have two buttons for incrementing and decrementing. So we start with our model. We create a type alias of our model, which, 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 is, a just, which is just a alias for uh, the built-in integer type. Then we have also uh, uh, init function, a built-in function that lets us uh, define a initial value of our model. Then we have a view function, which like I said um, earlier, uh, takes a model and returns our the template that is supposed to be rendered. So uh, each HTML element is of course represented as a function. And each uh, function representing HTML element takes two values. They take a list of uh, HTML attributes associated with this element and a list of children. So in this example, we want to render a div that contains a button text and uh, uh, one more button inside. And for our messages, uh, messages, uh, uh, those action of ours. We have in this case two actions. We have increment and we have decrement. And the update function uh, takes the message and the previous model. And uh, with those information, in its, uh, it processes it and returns a new state. Which is what is cool about Elm, it's that uh, it uses something like pattern matching. I won't dive into pattern matching uh, this time, but I deeply encourage you to, to do it uh, on your own because it's pretty interesting. And a lot of languages today uh, use, this, um, use this functionality. You can think of 
you can think of it like a, a switch case on steroids. So uh, the case in this case, uh, the case expressions uh, processes the messages, uh, processes the message. And when uh, the message is of value increment, it returns incremented model. And if it's de de decrement, it returns the decremented model. And what is also cool about the pattern matching and case expressions in L is that all case expressions must be exhaustive. And that means if we, we, have to de we have to handle all cases of the value that is uh, case matched. So if we were to, for example, remove this decrement part of the case expression, the compiler would complain and throw an error and wouldn't compile our code any further. And what's what's next about Elmo and what really sold me about this language was to was uh, two things that it promises no runtime errors and there is no concept of no uh, or undefined in this case. And this really blew my mind when I first saw it when running through the documentation because I at the time and right now even I'm uh there are some cases there are some some situations where i'm really frustrated with all those unexpected no or undefined values that are uh, running through uh, my applications and to have to deal with all of those and uh, how does elm uh, how does elm uh, handle uh, non-existing uh, values it uses something borrowed from the uh, popular uh, FP languages like Haskell. It uses type Elm, and for, uh, sorry, a type maybe. A type maybe is a generic type that takes a generic type A, and it can be of two values. It can, it can, if the value exists, is just this value. If it doesn't exist, it just nothing. So. For example, we, we could have a sanitize function that, that takes a user's input and uh, turns, it, turns it into integer, but uh, not all strings can be uh, mapped to integers. So instead of just uh, returning integer, we have to uh, return maybe integer. So it was maybe converted or maybe not. So for this, uh, for this input, we first for example, trim it and then use built in to int function that returns uh, maybe of int. Then we can use this input that we've just uh, returned from this function, for example, and create a function that uh, uh, either uh, returns the value of the integer or just the some uh, default value. So we take our input as an input to the function. And uh, we are doing a pattern matching on the input. So in case this input is just value, we return this value. We unwrap it from the from the maybe type. If it's nothing, we return some example uh, example value like zero. And how um, Elm deals with some unex unexpected. Uh, Unexpected data that is uh, pretty much that can be uh, out of our control, like for example, with uh, uh, grabbing some data via HTTP request. It uh, encourages us or even forces us to create some structure that is called a JSON decoder. And the JSON decoder is a structure that represent how is the JSON we expect should be decoded. So they are built in like atomic decoders for basic primitive types like decoder for string, for integers, for booleans, etc. And decoders for composing those into more sophisticated decoders like decoders for uh, like imaginary, uh, imaginary uh, type of Hero, for example, we can compose smaller, uh, smaller uh, decoders into a decoder that uh, successfully decodes uh, our uh, hero data. So, in terms of this uh, getting hero data, we can create a function that 
uh, takes the URL representing by string and returns a command. Let me just remind you that command is something uh, that is used to communicate with the Elm runtime. And in this case, we send a command to do a, an HTTP request to the Elm runtime. So this built-in get functions uh, takes an, as an argument object with the URL and something called expect. And we uh, declare with the expect JSON function that we expect a JSON in return. Then we uh, then we uh, mm, declare which message should be sent when the the, the call is uh, done, and the hero decoder we've created for the for the JSON uh, JSON data that we expect. Okay, so Elm versus TypeScript. Uh, Mm, I think it's a good starting point to say that Elm and TypeScript are fundamentally a different concepts, maybe, because Elm is a whole different language with uh, its own compiler that uh, compiles to JavaScript, which is with its own tooling syntax, etc. And TypeScript is uh, like a superset of JavaScript, so it's uh, like a wrapper to the on the existing language. And in this case, any JavaScript code is a valid TypeScript code. So aside of that, I think there are small cases where, with though in which those uh, two technologies are different. So for example, something that I've mentioned uh, on the previous slides, like prevents uh, runtime data inconsistency, like with uh, API changes. You can imagine a situation where you use some external API like Google Maps API, Facebook API, etc., or some uh, less trustworthy uh, APIs. And uh, you can imagine this API has, with new version has a whole different uh, breaking changes and uh, data inconsistencies with, with compar comparing to the previous version. And after that, our applications just break because the data we expect are not there. And uh, with Elm, we use something like those decoders that I've been mentioning and the power of uh, pattern matching and the Elm compiler that, um, that um, like, Force, forces us, but in a, in a good way for our own safety and for safety of our users, forces us to, to consider every scenario of our request in this example. Uh, uh, for example, every uh, success and every error that can occur during this, uh, during this HTTP call, either on the level of the, of the network or, on, or even on the level of the decoding the data from JSON. And with TypeScript, it isn't forced. Uh, let me remind you that, types, uh, that TypeScript has, uh, is only a type safe on a like, uh, build level, on a development level. It doesn't provide a static typing in runtime. So it's in, this, in that case, it's different from L. But this, uh, this, like, uh, this feature of uh, TypeScript comes from the nature of JavaScript, which is like dy dynamic language. And also there are solutions to mitigate this problem, like, uh, uh, like libraries for decoding and coding uh, values, like uh, libraries like Zod or IOTS that can, be, can help with such a problems. Uh, there are also no concept of null or undefined in Elm, which is, uh, of course, existing in JavaScript and TypeScript. And uh, yeah, the, the next thing that TypeScript has to, had to uh, deal because it derives from JavaScript. Then there's uh, immutability. Uh, immutability exists and it's used uh, in Elm, but not in TypeScript. But I wouldn't consider it as a disadvantage because, uh, because what I said earlier, that mutability can be both a good thing and a bad thing. And when it's used properly, it's, it should be fine. And also, we can mitigate this problem if we want to 
use immutable data structures in JavaScript or TypeScript, we can use libraries for that, for example, Emer. In L, there's no type of any or unknown, uh, which exists in TypeScript. And it exists there solely because of the like a compatibility problem for the projects and developers for who are working on migrating migrating their JavaScript code bases to TypeScript. It just so, it solves the problem of uh, the, just the makes the, uh, the migration as frictionless as possible. But of course, because of the strong typing of Elm, there's no need for such a types. And because of this uh, st very strict typing, uh, Elm and its compiler prevent uh, poor typing from third party, party libraries. We can imagine a hypo hypothetical situation with JavaScript and TypeScript where someone creates an awesome JavaScript library and the community is asking for a TypeScript support. But the author doesn't want to learn TypeScript and uh, and uh, he does that, but uh, and he changes the all the extensions of the file from Java from JS to TS, and uh, as a result, any any type there is in this application in this library is just any. And both technologies are in their own way easy to adopt in existing project. In terms of TypeScript, uh, you um, the migration can, not always is so easy, but the concepts is really easy. You just uh, take, you just change uh, extension of the file from JS to TS and gradually add all the types. And with Elm, you can integrate it with any existing web application like uh, React application, Vue, Angular, Svelte, or vanilla JavaScript. You have to just uh, download the compiler of Elm, create a basic uh, basic application inside your code base, and point out the the specific HTML element where the Elm application should be rendered in. Just to sum up, uh, uh, there is a solution for using uh, functional programming in uh, TypeScript. The most popular is uh, FPTS. It's the, I think, largest library with the largest ecosystem. It's pluggable, tree shakeable, all the cool stuff in it. And there's also uh, FFTS, which is like a, a newer kit on a block. And uh, it takes a quite different approach because it's a port of the uh, Zio library, which is a library for doing functional programming in Scala. Okay, and let me just show you uh, other languages that compile to JavaScript or the other FP languages. Um, other than Elm, you have uh, Rescript, which is like uh, something you could uh, say that is uh, JavaScript on steroids, maybe with a really strong typing. Uh, and it's a completely uh, different language created by uh, Facebook, if I'm not mistaken. There is my personal favorite, PureScript. PureScript is a pure functional pr uh, programming language that is really inspired by Haskell. It's so inspired by Haskell that uh, if you are to learn PureScript or Haskell, you would find yourself quite comfortable with the, the second language. And also there's uh, Scala.js, which is a library for creating web applications using Scala languages. And it's worth to mention that within all four languages, so those three and Elm, only PureScript and Elm can be considered uh, can be considered pure functional programming languages, because in Rescript and Scala you can uh, you can program both functionally and both uh, in object oriented way or like a, a imperative way uh, and. Uh, Okay. Other than that, I think some of you may enjoy learning Elm by 
just going through the code bases of the existing Elm applications. And for that reason, I've created, uh, for example, small application that is called Elm Survey App, uh, just for the purpose of this presentation. You can find it on the on this link below or by reading this QR code. And I will. This survey app is just serving a survey that is uh, that is about this particular presentation. So I would greatly appreciate it if you would take three minutes to complete it. Also, there's a very cool initiative that is called Real World Example App. And this real world uh, app is just a copy of an existing uh, platform that is called uh, Medium. And Medium is a platform for uh, creating blog posts. And real world uh, gathers all the solutions for different technologies for both front end and back end side. So, for example, you can wire up a front end in Elm and back end in, I don't know, Python's Django. And you can wire this up and have an existing application. Or for example, if you know one web technology like uh, Angular and would like to learn React, you can uh, clone both repositories in, uh, in those two technologies and just compare those to how they work and how, the, how those differ. And there's also an interactive playground in the, in the, in the Elm documentation on the Elm website. Also, I've gathered some learning resources for, uh, for beginners. My example is beginning Elm. Of course, I'll try to share with you the link for this presentation afterwards. And a couple of more tutorials uh, I found interesting and the talk by Ivan Czaplitsky, which, which is and he's uh, author of Elm about some design decisions behind this language. And yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you all for listening and being patient with me. And just to remind you, uh, you can find my work on Twitter or on my blog. And here's again the QR code and link to this uh, survey application I had. Thanks again. <laughs>